Hey, it's the end of the session. I'm here without uh, Brooklyn or Rex or Opie, uh, but this is their roadmap to success. Now I'm wearing red because it's Friday. Remember, you're supposed to wear red to support uh, the uh, our medical community uh, during the coronavirus. So uh, I'd be supportive. Uh, they're doing a lot of stuff to support us so we can do a, wear a little red and return the favor. Um, now in this video, I'm just basically gonna summarize the stuff we went over in the session. Now Rex has already taken our puppy classes. So I think the Guardian, are, uh, the, I know the Guardian is several steps ahead of where my normal clients are. So I'm gonna skip some of the stuff that I normally do. I'm just gonna kind of go through them as a highlight. Now I have videos for all the things that we're gonna go over. So if there's anything you're not sure about, uh, uh, other than the two videos above, which would be just, that was pretty self-explanatory. But if you have any questions on them or anything else, message me, text me. If I don't hear from you, I assume that means everything's going great. All right, so um, the first thing we did was talked about a little bit about the, about their backstory and what happened. Um, I think the dogs are under exercised. Rex is almost, he's a little bit over two or about to be two. So he's, he's starting to get into that kind of where they, the labs kind of plateau their energy. But before then, they're just, and that's definitely where, uh, where uh, Opie is. And Opie being nine months old. So um, the guardians definitely need to get more exercise for the dog. Now, the guardian has a bunch of life commitments, and so it's difficult for her to walk. And when she tried to walk all three dogs together, uh, or two, even two dogs together, it just really was more than she could deal with. So I know it seems easier when you have multiple dogs to try to just power through it and get it through it with all the dogs together. It's not. Science has shown it's much faster if you do it individually. So um, I think that exercise or lack of exercise is a big contributing factor here. Um, it's not the only thing. Rex has got a couple issues. He's a little bit jealous about certain things. Um, but uh, the more that uh, the do rescue dogs that come in the house, the guardians use the techniques above, that should help him get over those particular problems and actually have him think when people come over or dogs come over, it's a good thing. Um, so basically, uh, but the energy is always a factor. It's one of the first questions I asked. So um, we went over some creative forms of exercise. The guardian uh, knew what some of these were, but weren't, weren't practicing them because it was uh, during, uh, because she couldn't do it with multiple dogs. So you do these with separate, uh, with each dog separately. Remember to exercise the dogs with an empty stomach. They have a distended stomach and can flip over and can be pressurized and explode. So about 90 minutes after eating before dogs exercise other than just a walk. Now, before I get into the creative forms of exercise, I would like the guardian to start walking one of the dogs every single day, only one dog. If you can walk multiples, that's great. But I don't care if it's only a two minute walk, obviously we prefer to have it longer than that, but I think it'll help the guardian to get out of the house away from the other dogs. And I know it'll help the dogs. It's uh, stimulus, uh, it's relaxing to sniff and all those fun things. So um, instead of walking this big circuit, when we have a circuit, we kind of put an artificial timeline on it. It always takes us 20 minutes minimum or longer to complete the circuit. So if the dog sniffs or wants to check things out, we don't like that because it's elongating the exercise. Or sometimes we're like, I only have 50 minutes of time. I'm not gonna walk you because it takes 20 minutes to walk. So instead walk with duration as your indicator. So if I have 10 minutes, I'm gonna walk this direction for five minutes. When the five, my timer goes off for five minutes, I turn around and I cross the street so I have fresh sniffs and I come back and I let the dog sniff as much as it wants as long as it's safe to do so. Dogs burn more energy by sniffing on a walk than they do from walking. So if you take out your circuit completion, you're just walking this way until your alarm goes off for whatever the duration is, three minutes, five minutes, 50 minutes, whatever it is, and then you turn around and you come back. You might only make it 100 yards. You don't care because your dog's sniffing, it's burning more energy, it's stimulating, it's relaxing, it's calming, it's beneficial. And it allows you to kind of just zone out because you're not minding the dog, you don't have to walk on a path, you're just kind of letting the dog walk around it. There's a ton of sniffs over here. So the dog's gonna be just snorting, sniffing like crazy, and you can kind of cool your jets and just kind of relax. Um, so that's uh, very stimulating for the dogs, and I'd like you to make a commitment to yourself that I'm gonna walk the dogs once a day, no one dog a day, no matter what, come hell or high water, for whatever duration of period of time that I have. Now dogs sleep a lot, and so uh, they, when they're asleep, they're recharging their batteries. So exercise is best done if it's sprinkled throughout the day in multiple shorter exercise sessions. And so what I'd like you to do is to do the Doggy Stairmaster, the game of Fetch, Scent Games, Google Scent Games, um, and then, uh, let me see, uh, also uh, walks and letting them sniff on walks are also beneficial ways to exercise. Feeding the two adult dog, or uh, the puppy, I guess the two males, um, out of snuffle mats is a nice way to also burn some excess energy because they have to work for their food to move the tassel up, lick up the treat, and repeat it 100 to 500 times each meal. Now, I'd like you to go to a structured feeding situation. This will help 
all the dogs practice a little bit of self-control. It all has also helped kind of create a, a healthy reinforcement of the, uh, the hierarchy amongst the dogs. We have Brooklyn, who is a very well-behaved elder dog or older dog, about six, seven, eight years old. And she's the only female, she's very well-behaved. So we wanna put her in the top position and let her eat first. So I'd like the guardian to have all the dogs out of the room using the, uh, the blockage thing that I showed you out here. And if you can't remember how to do that, uh, go to my website, search for invisible or kitchen. It, there's videos that show how to do that. Um, so basically, uh, do the, throw the out, do the out command like we showed you in puppy class. And then once the dogs are out of the kitchen, walk step by step and make sure you're facing the dog so you're walking backwards and you pause at each step. And if any dogs get ready to cross the threshold, you hiss and rush towards them. You can go back and forth and watch the video if you forget how to do it. Um, once you can get to where the actual food is, this is uh, again a, a small, I'm going to go through this one a little bit more detail because you can apply the same principle to a lot of different things. So if a dog doesn't know how to behave in an activity, what I do is I recreate the situation in the, e the easiest form or the most challenging form that I can make where it's reasonable for the dog to do. Pretty easy, essentially. And so you I make it an easy version of it and then you slice it into individual steps. And you help the dogs practice step one over and over and over again until it's behaving the whole time throughout the step. And anytime it deviates, you stop the activity, wait for it to reset, and then, continue, and then restart it again. So if the leash is kept, let's say, right here where the house is. So uh, I tell the dog to sit. If the dog sits within two seconds, remember, only say it once. If it sits within two seconds, I start reaching. I reach this far, the dog gets up, I pull my arm back down, go back to neutral, stop, and tell the dog sit. If it sits, I reach up again. If it gets up, I pull my arm back down, sit second time, uh, second occurrence. Uh, it sits down, I reach again, gets up, drop my hand, sit, third time. Fourth time I do it differently. I reach up, the dog gets up, I drop my arm and I just look at the dog. If the dog sits, then I reach again. If it doesn't sit, I walk to the couch or wherever I was doing and I walk away and disengage from the activity. So the dog is being, is being taught that when the first step is to sit down when we're about to attach the leash. The second step is as the human reaches for the leash, my job is to remain sitting. Most of us let our dogs get really worked up and excited and we wonder why they can't control themselves. Well, excitement is not happiness. It's an unbalanced state of mind. It's harder for dogs to focus just like it is for us. If I'm excited about something, I can't think cl as clearly as I can if I'm calm, balanced and present in the moment. So eventually the first stage is just reaching. At first you only reach this far before the dog gets up, then eventually this far, then this far. Then eventually you can touch it and the dog gets up and you drop your hand back to neutral each time. And then eventually you're able to actually pick it up. Then I jiggle the, uh, the attachment. That usually causes the dog to get up. That's a different stage. So I put it back and I'm gonna let my arm go back, tell it to sit. If it sits, I continue. If it doesn't, I go sit down and walk, uh, watch, the couch, watch TV or do whatever I was doing on the couch. Now people get very frustrated with doing it because I'm trying to take my dog for a walk and this is gonna take me forever. It will. So don't practice it when you're taking your dog for a walk. The dog doesn't know whether or not it's practiced or not. So just go overhead and put two of the dogs away, exercise the dogs first, then go over and reach for it, and then keep on do starting and stopping until the dog stays calm throughout the whole process. And then uh, if it doesn't, and you stop and you go and sit down because it didn't sit down within that two second window, you weren't planning on taking it for a walk anyways. The dog's like, oh my God, I didn't sit down and look what happened. We didn't go for a walk. Next time I better sit down and then the chances of us going for a walk increase. So you can do this for any sort of activity that your dog has a problem with. Ask yourself, how can I make it sufficiently difficult or easy enough for the dog to be able to do it? And then how can I break it into what are the individual steps and practice those steps over and over with each dog separately? Once you do all the individual steps, then you actually bring the next dog in or you keep on practicing them separately. Once they can do all the steps on their own, then you do the whole exercise without necessarily making it step by step. Once two of those dogs can do it separately together or separately, all the steps at once, then you bring those two best dogs together and help them practice. Once they've done it, then you bring in the third dog or go to your best dog and your worst dog. And eventually you've taught all the dogs the steps you want, how to do it, and what's expected. And if they don't do it, you stop and walk away. That's why it's helpful to not practice it when you plan on taking your dog for a walk, you plan on feeding your dog or whatever the case may be. Opportunities to do this, uh, putting the dog on a leash, opening the door, uh, putting, uh, uh, reaching to prepare the food, putting the food bowls down. So there are a lot of other applications for this as well. So um, I'd like the guardian to also think about exercise in a more of a proactive fashion. Most of us are reactive when it comes to our dog's exercise. We don't get them enough exercise. When they misbehave and get really bad, sometimes we take them out, but we usually consider the dog naughty. 
because it's misbehaving and uh, being rambunctious. But if you have a child and you're at a barbecue and that it's time for the child to get a nap, you don't say, well, the child's doing so well, I'm gonna stay here if it's a really young child. You stop and you go home and get that child a nap because you're proactive, you know if you don't, the child's gonna cry for, you know, it's gonna take you two or three days to get back in that regular routine. So you are proactive and you're very, uh, make sure that you're doing it ahead of time so that you're fulfilling the baby's needs before it needs it. Puppies and dogs, we wait for them to explode and then we try to do it and it's almost too late. So I'd like you to start thinking if the dog is coming up and jumping up on me, probably saying I need some exercise. If it's rambunctious barking, if they zoom zooming around the house, if they're challenging each other, whatever it is, exercise them. And remember, there's a certain amount of exercise that will set them up for success for different activities. Maybe before, like the school gets out here at 3.30. So if it's gonna take me, let's say it's gonna take 15 minutes to exercise the dog separately with the doggy Stairmaster, five minutes for each dog, let's just say on average. Well, that's gonna take me uh, 15 minutes to do. So at 2.45, if I do that, that's 15 minutes worth of practice. Uh, and then the dogs need 10 minutes to recover. So the last dog finishes at three o'clock, shouldn't be until 3.10 before kids are coming by. So I guess in this case, maybe we'd practice at three o'clock, then the dogs are recovering. And then I would bring the dogs out here one dog per day when the kids are coming by and do the click for looks thing that I was showing you above. So now when kids walk by, I get a treat. Now it's harder because there's a whole symphony of kids that are coming by. So you really need to have that wood up there that's blocking or some sort of visual blockage so the dog only sees the kid for a brief second of time and then they're outside the visual acuity. And now the presence or arrival of kids or dogs or whatever the thing might be is a precursor to something good happening. I'm about to get a treat or a reinforcement. Um, so really try to keep that in the back of your head because you're gonna find yourselves that you're gonna be calling the dog naughty or whatever it is and when it's really we didn't fulfill their needs. Okay, so that's exercise. We also talked about rules. The guardian here has done a, a good job of asking a dog for, certain, uh, for a lot of rules. I would like the dogs to uh, go that structured feeding. I think that's a nice way to help elevate Brooklyn into a senior status and help the other two dogs practice a little self-restraint, self-control. And also sell, he, see the adopting dog seeing that it's eating, or the uh, foster dog seeing that it's, it's being fed in the last position. It has the lowest level of status amongst the group. So they're gonna naturally try to throw their elbows and challenge a little bit. So we could do some things to kind of orchestrate it. Hey, these are the dogs that are established. You're the visitor and so you eat last. And after, and that's a good helpful thing for all the dogs. Now take a little bit of practice when you first get a new puppy or dog as a foster. But once your dogs are done, even when you're, when you're not fostering, get in a structured habit. So Brooklyn uh, is the senior dog and, and uh, uh, Rex respects her. But helping, helping practice things like I talked to you about uh, at the end, of the end of our session out here. Sometimes I practice things um, even when I don't need to practice them to help for when I do need to practice them. I don't have to go brush up because it's kind of, I've been maintaining it. Um, okay, so um, uh, some of the rules have to sit at the door. Um, you have to sit outside the, or you have to remain outside the kitchen where I prepare your food. You have to remain outside the kitchen until you're called in to eat the food. And the dogs will be fed one at a time. Only one dog that's in the, in the feeding area uh, uh, and the other two dogs have to stay outside the line. When that dog gets done, it has to leave and the next dog comes in. Now, sometimes dogs when they're waiting together, two dogs that have beefed, if the energy level gets high, they might try to, they might try to fight each other if they're trying to get in, if they're competing for a resource. So keep an eye on that um, and be, have somebody else ready the first couple times you're trying to, so we can intercede. Remember what they do, for, uh, freak out, a short uh, 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 no or stop in a very deep, powerful voice as opposed to excited voice is gonna be your best chance at stopping them. Now they got into a little bit of a mini fight out here um, early in the session. And it started off as play and then it transitioned. So remember, just like in puppy class, the dogs have 10 levels of energy. Whenever they pass level five energy for play, I don't care if they're having a great time or not, they get a timeout until they, their energy comes down to about a one or two. Then we let them play again. Um, and that's exactly what happened. And Rex was towering over the other dog. Well, I can't remember, one of them was towering over the other. And then it took too far, and then I like, we were able to pull them apart. But if you have to pull them apart, we wait and we let it go too long. Now again, exercising before these sort of activities will set them up for success. Exercise is something I'm gonna hammer away at because I think it's really, really important for the, these particular dogs. So, um, all right. So basically, uh, we wanna create a situation where maybe we exercise them first, we give them the re relaxation, then we do the uh, feeding exercise or whatever these exercises are to set them up for success, make it easier for us. Um, we also talked about uh, premax. Now premax means a less desirable behavior will earn me a more desirable behavior. If I do my homework, I can watch TV. If I do my chores, I can go play with my friends. 
uh, and so on. It has, to, it has to be a behavior as the reward. So try to look for opportunities where if Rex wants something, he has to do something for you first before he gets that reward. Um, and you can try a lot of applications for this, but it's a really powerful way to have the dog start to shift its leader follower mindset a little bit. Now, um, let me see. We also, also went over petting with a purpose of passive training. We went over these in puppy class, but petting with a purpose is if you want to pet the dog or the dog wants you to pet it, you tell it to sit. If it's already sitting here, it has to sit. You tell it to sit here, 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 or here, or lay down. And if it does sit down, then you pet it under its chin and, and pet it as much or as little as you want. Was, I would say sit, the dog sits, I would say sit again and then start petting it or sit and then give it a treat. But in this case, for this, I'd probably just do is, uh, pets only. So the dog comes over, I say sit, it sits, I start petting it. I pet it as much or as little as I want. Now, if I stop petting it and, and it sits again and it sits again, well, it's probably saying I need some exercise. Uh, if the dog does not sit, show the dog I have other things going on and go read an uh, uh, article, uh, check out emails on your phone, play a game, hang out with your kids, put, make out with the husband, whatever you want to do. Um, show the dog I have other things going on. I wanted to make you number one, but you didn't do what I wanted to do. That's fine. I'm on to the next thing. After a while, the dog would be motivated to want to listen to you because it, you don't care. You're on to the next thing, and the dog's the one that misses out. You're not upset because remember, good attention, bad attention, same thing. Now remember, dogs go through life probing to see where the boundary of the limit is. So they're probing, waiting for somebody to disagree. Oh, that's the edge. Okay, I'm gonna move over here and try. Oh, that's the edge, they disagreed. And they disagreed, and they disagreed, and they disagreed, and they disagreed. And we take this personally. How many times does it take the dog to figure it out? The dog's being persistent to determine, are you sure that this is a rule? Are you sure this is a rule? And once you reach a tipping point, a number of times consistently in a row, the dog's like, okay, I got it. I'm not allowed to cross that particular line. We are very inconsistent and that's where a lot of these problems come from. So try to be very mindful. And if your dog is not gonna, uh, if there's opportunity for it to do the wrong thing, then make sure you recreate that situation where you control the environment and have the dog behave the way that you want them to behave. All right, going back, going back to petting with the purpose. If the dog tells you what to do, nothing happens. You tell the dog instead to sit. When the dog sits, if it sits, pet it on its chin and say sit right before you start petting it. Pet it as much as little as you want. Um, and use the word toward paycheck. If he comes in the room and say paycheck to me and I'm petting the dog, I would stop petting the dog even if I did it right. Tell the dog to sit. If it sits, I pet it on its chin and say sit. Or I say sit and then start petting it. And then I tell the guard, the other person, I actually asked the dog to sit. You missed it. But thanks for reminding me. It's a nice way to help yourselves stay present with it. Um, also, I'd like the guardians to uh, make a list of the official command words. A lot of times we have multiple words for a different, uh, for the same action, and it's harder for the dogs to learn. Um, so petting with the purpose, if the dog tells you what to do now, nothing happens other than you tell it to do something else. And if it does it, then it gets a reward, kind of a pre-mac. And after a while, the dog will start coming and sitting in front of you to prepay for the attention. When it does, make sure you pet that dog because that's what we're looking for. Um, uh, now, uh, Opie likes to jump up. And he likes to jump up and the guardian is shoving. Now, we're bipeds. We, as mammal or as he, uh, humans, chimps, we use our hands to do things. Dogs don't do that. They use their body. They body check. So I'd like you to instead, uh, when you see Opie's coming over to you, uh, to kind of body check him. He's trying to jump up on your lap. If he does it multiple times, again, he needs an exercise. Uh, you're going to do a Zoom call, exercise him first. And then you have a well-behaved dog in the background because he's tired. We burn that excess energy off. Now, whenever he uh, Opie jumps up on you, I want you to just cross your arms, cross your chest, and just become boring. Wait for him to jump down. When he jumps down, then tell him to sit or to lay down. If he jumps down and goes straight into a sit, then tell him to come and sit over here or here. So if you reward the jumping down, then he jumps back up to get the off. And I think that the guardian turning is also a reward for him. And one of the fights happened because he jumped up on one of the guardians who came home and Rex didn't like that because for dogs, when they jump up on us when we first arrive, that's a way of claiming us. I think Rex was a little jealous as a person that's a member of the family but doesn't live here. So he's like, how dare you? And then they got into a fight. Now, what I do when I come home, and uh, I've got a video for this if you want to go over it, but when you have guests like that come over, have them come over and knock at the door. Even though they're a family member, they can come in, but let's use the door as a barrier. So we come over and knock at the door and ring the doorbell, whatever it is, and they run to the door. And they're like, oh my God, it's this person. I'm so excited to see them. Come in, come in, come in, come in. Why are you not coming in? Are you not going to come in? Why are you standing there? Now my energy has calmed down and my energy calms down. Then the person reaches and jiggles, reaches, reaches the handle. The dog gets excited again. And what do we do? We pull back like I described a couple minutes ago. And this will be a start and stop over and over again. First, just reaching for the handle, then jiggling the handle, then opening the door a little bit and closing it. And we're teaching the dogs to be calm and balanced. When people come to the door, they never come in where we're all hyper and excited like this. We're calm, that's when they start the process of coming in. When I get excited, that's when the process stops. 
If the dogs are calm when we come in, they're gonna be less likely to jump up on us. Now we need to make sure everybody in the house does not pet the dogs when they jump up because that's rewarding that behavior. Anything your dog is doing, you pet is what you're rewarding. So when you come home, I would have you do the door exercise as well. Even though you can come through the garage door, do the door exercise, wait for them to kind of settle down. What I do when I come home, I've already achieved this with my dogs, but they're still excited once I come past the barrier. I just ignore them. I walk past them. I'm not paying any attention. And then as soon as they calm down, I reach to pet and they get a wiggle. I pull my arm back and continue doing what I was doing. Going to wash my hands probably. Smart thing to do. Um, and so eventually the dogs, I start and stop multiple times. And eventually the energy crescendo kind of calms down, calms down, and they're e better able to listen to us and focus on what we want. And that way you're not rewarding the dog for jumping up or making a big deal out of the dog jumping up, which also is a reward. And then we don't, Rex doesn't have to worry about the other dog having, uh, jumping up on this person that I like to claim them because it's probably calm and balanced. Um, because we achieved that by taking the time when we entered in. So look at it as an opportunity when people come in, you know, when it's a regular guest, you want to have them wait at the door. But if it's your family members or your friends, you can have them do that. I mean, during Corona, we don't have a lot of people up there. So the dogs are kind of out of sorts by, uh, by the reward. Now, uh, or uh, out of sorts by, they don't have a lot of guests coming in. So the other thing I'd like you to do is use that clicker. One of the things you can do is you can have the dog in a leash, have the leash go down. If this is my foot, the leash goes down here and then goes up to the dog's collar. So that prevents the dog from being able to reach the, fur, the, the f highest level they can jump up at. You want to kind of stop them in the middle of it. And then what you could do is you can use the same sort of thing, have people come in, you're stepping halfway on a leash, so the dog has the ability to rise halfway up into a jump, but the person's just slightly outside the reach, so the dog's gonna jump, jump, jump halfway up there. And what you do is let them kind of do that. Now, exercising them first sets them up for success. They're doing this jumpy, jumpy, but the person's just standing there, and the person probably should be sideways to them. And um, when the dog calms down a little bit, tell it to sit. When it sits, click it, give it a treat. Uh, I say click, sit, treat. And if the dog stays calm, then you can have the guest start to reach for it. The dog's gonna start to jump up again, but the leash prevents them from actually reaching them. And then the guest takes a step backwards and turns sideways. So what we're saying is when people come in the door, when you're calm, I'm very attractive if I wanna pet you. When you get excited, I reach, step outside your reach and go to the side. And the leash is preventing them from getting all the way up, which is gonna cause a little bit of frustration, but I like it in a good way, because the dog can't achieve getting up there. But as soon as I sit down, the guest tries to pet and engage with me. And this again might take 10, 15, 20 times, but eventually the dog starts to learn when the guest comes in, if I sit here, I get a treat and pets from the new person. If I jump up on them, they just freeze and become boring. So that's why you wanna create these situations. And if you're caught off guard, then hold on, I'll come in and get you and put the dogs in the kennel if you have to. And when you're doing this, for the jumping thing I just described on the leash, I would have the other two dogs away because they're just gonna fuel the fire. Um, and just work on the rescue dog until he can get to the point where he just sits when people come to the door. So that's why it's helpful family and, family, family and friends help because we want, this is a numbers game, we want to do it as much as we can. Um, also keep on celebrating, we call that passive training, which we're just basically rewarding the dogs when it does the things that we want. So every time it looks at you, pet it and say eyes. Every time it sits, you pet it, uh, say sit and pet it, excuse me. It looks at you, say eyes, then pet it. Uh, it sits, pay, say sit, then pet it. Lays down, say crash, then pet it. Um, for whatever the things are. Um, same thing with feeding. Now what I do is um, I would assign a different command word for each of the three dogs. So when Brooklyn's about to eat, maybe you say pizza, because you know they like pizza in Brooklyn. And, or whatever the word is you want to say. So she's walking over, here's the food bowl, she's walking, I say Brooklyn, and then she starts eating. So the word is a precedent to the action. And after a while, the word means I get to go eat, and the other two dogs hear Brooklyn, or hear pizza, they never get to eat when they're at pizza, because their words are pork chop and meatball, or whatever it is. So each assign a command word for each individual dog. Um, let me see, the two videos above I think should be pretty helpful. If you have questions on those or anything else, please message me. If I don't hear from you, I assume that that means everything's going great. So if you have any questions, please let me know. All right, well, um, inside is Brooklyn and uh, Opie, and, who hopefully will be adopted soon, and uh, as well as um, one of my favorite puppies from Puppy Class, Rex. And this is the roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.